I'm Professor Green and I grew up in London, where the number of children living in poverty is the highest of anywhere in the UK. Some of my earliest memories are of struggles with money. There were six of us in a three bedroom flat when I was born. You know, there was a lot of shouting and well, screaming and shouting because there was a lot of a lot of unhappiness and a lot of stress. There was always stress over money. I remember my nan overstretching herself quite often, probably to try and fill the void in my life, which were two parent-shaped holes. And as a kid, you don't understand all the details of things, but you feel what's going on. You know, any time any of the debt collectors come around to collect money, I'd get shuffled off into another room. But that said, there were people in much more severe situations than what I was in when I was growing up. Today, 27 years on, and one in four children in Britain are growing up in poverty. I don't care if they call me poor and all that, but it's like, you don't understand my situation, how I'm here. This can mean being cold or going hungry, but it can also have a devastating emotional impact on a child's life. <laughs> I don't want to move anymore. <laughs> the UK is one of the richest countries in the world, but the number of kids in poverty is predicted to rise by a million in the next five years. I want to understand what effect this is having on the children growing up poor in Britain today. I've come to Dagnum in East London, which has one of the highest rates of child poverty in the capital. I'm meeting a family who I'm shocked to discover are being evicted from their home today. Hi, Nikki. Yeah, hi. Stephen. Hi. Nice to meet you. Yeah, sure. Single mum Nikki and her kids, four-year-old Robert, five-year-old Kirsty, and 10-year-old Kelly Louise have lived here for the last five years but the landlord's selling the property and they can't afford the rental deposit on a new home. This is your room here. Our toys have all been packed away so we don't really have any much. Does it feel weird being in a room so empty now that all your stuff's packed away? Yeah, I feel really empty and in the morning, normally um, my brother Robert comes in our room and we all watch TV nicely together or we play with our toys, um, but this morning, and um, now that has happened. It's horrible knowing that all their toys are in bags and they can't play with anything and they're getting bored. And... Kelly's mum suffers with anxiety and depression and hasn't been able to work for the last two years. She relies on disability allowance and housing benefit. My mum, she doesn't have that much money and because of that, we can't really do stuff. Like, we don't really have much money for food. We don't really have any money for, like, extra toys or anything. And it's really hard. With no spare cash or savings, the family can't afford to find a place of their own. Their only option is to rely on the council to rehouse them. So the kids are going to go off to school this morning and they don't know they where don't they're going to come back to. Now. It could be B&B, &B, it could be hostel, I don't know. And they said I could be there for up to 10 years before I get a permanent place. So. 10 years? Yeah. Mental? Yeah. I mean, even just that word, homeless, how does that feel, you know, with three kids? Yeah, it's scary to know that your kids are going to be classed as homeless and there's nothing you can do about it. My brother Robert, he's like running around, he's like, I don't care, I don't know what's happening, so leave me alone, wandering around like that. Yeah, I guess with you being the oldest, you've got a little bit more responsibility. Yeah, and a lot more worry for it. Yeah. Does that make it hard then, going to school with that kind of worry in your head? Yeah. I hope that they don't move us somewhere far away because I really want to stay in the school. Because when I don't have my friends with me, I feel really upset. I feel really lonely. And it's really hard for me to settle without some friends that I already know. I'm going to see you, Mum. Sorry. It's really difficult talking to a 10-year-old who's so aware of everything that's happening um, and also because of that awareness is affected by it all. You can tell she's really insecure about the prospect of perhaps having to leave everything that she knows, her school, her friends, her family. And I think in this situation, you'd 
be inclined to worry for Nikki, you know, and what she's going through, trying to look after the kids and all the stresses that she has. But, you know, you forget that kids are, kids are, kids are smart. Mm. Frightening, you know, they've just left the house they've been in for five years and they've got no idea where they're going to be sleeping tonight. That must be a horrible, horrible thing to have to deal with as a kid. I mean, as an adult, it would unsettle you. One of the biggest problems facing families living in poverty is affordable housing, and Nikki has run out of options. I went privately looking at estate agents. I've been everywhere like that, uh, even like Gumtree yeah. and all them sort of ads just to try and find somewhere else. But they want too much up front, and mm -hmm. they want months deposit, months in advance, and the estate agents want fees, and I don't have that money to just go, here you go. Mm -hmm. And then, because I'm on benefits, they want guarantors. I don't have anyone that earns enough to be a guarantor. If you take that along to the council, yeah. after, yeah. right, okay. you would have had one that come through the door. That would yeah. be different to that. Yeah. That one shows you are going to be evicted. Yeah. This one shows you have been evicted. Right, OK, so this is what they've got to say. That's what, you, that's what they've got to say down the council in order to take one to the next level. Right, OK. All right, thank you so much. No worries. Nikki's known for six months that they'll be kicked out. But only now they've been evicted do they qualify for rehousing by the council. It's scary. This is what it comes down to. A what? piece of paper saying that you've got homeless, basically. Nikki's going to queue up at the housing office, hoping she'll be offered accommodation before the kids are back from school. Poverty in 21st century Britain means kids growing up in homes with as little as £13 a day to cover food, bills, clothes and activities. It can mean missing out on things most of us take for granted, even just having a place to call home. In South London, I've come to meet a boy and his family who've been stuck in emergency accommodation for the last 18 months. Hello. Tyler lives on the third floor of a former hotel in two small rooms with brother Keon and mum Tara. Because of my health problems, I could turn around and say, no, I'm not gonna take it, I'm gonna sit. The when the government put a new cap on benefit payments, Tara was no longer able to pay her rent and they were evicted from their three bedroom home. This is where my mum sleeps. Like, um, it's comfortable, but it's so like small and my mum's quite a big person. It's kind of like uncomfortable. Um, this is where we cook and all that. That's our washing up. It's dirty right now because obviously like my mum didn't have enough time because she went shopping and all that to clean up and all that. And this is where we shower and sometimes wash up and wash clothes and all that because there's not enough space. You have to do that in the shower because there's not enough space yeah. out there. There's not enough room for a washing machine either, is there? Yeah, no, there's not enough room for anything, really. <laughs> Some old curtains separate the tiny room where Tyler and his brother sleep from the cramped living area where his mum sleeps. Uh, this is my uh, my brother's bedroom. We find it comfortable because obviously it's a double bed. Yeah, but what about the fact that, because you're how old? Uh, 14. 14 and he's 15, isn't Yeah, he's 15. Yeah, so it must get uncomfortable. Yeah, it gets uncomfortable right because obviously like, we're at that age where we don't really like sharing rooms. We like separate rooms. I don't really like having friends around here. I don't care if they call me poor and all that, but it gets me angry when they say, oh, why are you living in here? Why are you living in here? That's what gets me angry because it's like, you don't understand my situation, how I'm here. If you understood, if I told you, then you would be like, okay, yeah, cool, Tyler's all right. Tyler made me realize that child poverty isn't just about food on the table or a place to live. It's about the shame and embarrassment these kids are made to feel when their parents are struggling with money. We've basically got about 80 pounds to live on per two weeks. For food so that and travel? Food. Travel, they're growing boys. Yeah. They need clothes. So it's hard. It is hard. Tara suffers with depression and chronic back pain and is reliant on benefits. She's been a single mum since Tyler's dad left 12 years ago. Do you think with everything that, that Tyler's had to take on board, he keeps stuff from you? Completely. 
completely. He keeps a lot to himself, a hell of a lot to himself. He's like a sponge, he'll absorb everything. And then when he goes out, he just lets loose, mm. completely lets loose. I mean, not always outside, sometimes he'll look loose in here, yeah. you know, to the point where he'll smash doors and break up this. And that, to me, kind of shows how much he's feeling inside. Yeah. And I think it's not because he doesn't want to tell me, it's because he feels he can't. Do you think what you're going through at the moment has any effect on Tyler's prospects or his hopes for the future? I do. I worry that because we're here, Tyler thinks he's not worthy of anything. So he hasn't got to worry about his exams. He hasn't got to worry about studying because he may feel he's not worth any more than where we are now. And I do worry, yeah. Tyler knows drug dealers that are here. Yeah. I worry that he's gonna think, well, we need a bit of extra money. Let me just do this, let me just do that. I just worry that that's what he's gonna get into. Kids growing up in poverty are more likely to become involved in crime or violence. And I was worried about the temptations Tyler might be exposed to. What is there to do around it? Nothing really, just play basketball. Is there any youth centres or oh, anywhere no, for the nothing, kids to go? Nothing around this whole block, it's just literally, there's not even like a football pitch. You've got to walk about 20 minutes for a football pitch. Mm. I've seen even people smash people's car windows just for enjoyment. Oh yeah, we smash someone's window, blah, blah, blah. That's what they do around here, like. So just out of boredom? Yeah. Like, people smash windows every day. Your mum's worried about you coming out here, who you're mixing with, yeah. who you're going to end up getting involved with, hanging about with shotters and dealers, yeah. and ending up selling drugs because, you know, you feel the financial strain that she's under. Yeah, no, I've, there's been times where I've always wanted to sell, start shotting, mm. because I think I need my kind of part in the family. Let me give mum, like, £100 to go do food shopping or go get whatever she wants. Give mum a little treat. But then, do you know what? Think forward. What will happen if you start shotting? You're going to go to prison. You're going to go to prison. You're going to get killed. You know, what sort of childhood is he having? He's not getting to experience his childhood as a child. And the stress that he's having, whether he understands it or not, is coming out in other ways and it's causing behavioural issues. And just having all of that energy that I'm sure if he had something that he enjoyed that he could focus it on, he'd be in such a better place. But there's nothing on offer. There's nothing mound here. It's, you know, housing in chicken shops and off-licenses. And not much else. There's a lot of people who put blame on people, like, well, they must be in that situation because they've done something to be there, they deserve to be there. But if you fast forward in 30 years and Tyler's in the same situation that his mum's in, is it really his fault? Ten-year-old Kelly Louise and her family were evicted from their three-bedroom home in Dagenham this morning. Mum Nikki has waited six hours at the council offices in the hope they'll find her a new home before her mum brings the kids back from school. We're going to stay in a room and we have to share the bathroom with other people and other families and the kitchen, we have to share that with other families, OK? And then, later on down the line, we will then move again. OK? You OK? 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 It's really hard. It's really hard. Everyone at school, they're really expecting me to um <laughs> to come to school and tomorrow um 
really happy about it and glad that about it, but I'm not really. I don't really like it at all. I want. <laughs> I don't want to move anymore. <laughs> I wish everything could stay as it is. <laughs> I'm seeing you upset about it. it makes me more upset. I'm not. Mummy's already upset because I feel like I've let you down. <laughs> okay. I'm not crying. The families I was meeting were very isolated. They didn't seem to know where to turn for support. I've travelled to Tyneside in the North East. The region has some of the highest rates of child poverty in the UK. In some areas, one in three kids are growing up poor. I'm meeting a pioneering child poverty charity called Tyne Gateway. How you doing, Steve? A team of support workers made up of mums and dads who've experienced poverty themselves help struggling families who may not have asked for help before. We've got lots of pressures on all of our families at the moment, mm -hmm. but obviously the finances are the things that stress people most. So even if they have addiction, even if they have, you know, poor school attendance, unemployment, we need to get the finances sorted first because that's yeah. the thing that stops them sleeping at night. A lot of them haven't got, like, the, the just the basic understanding of managing a bank account or managing the money, so the money just will be gone. Mm. It's always been matter of fact, but why do you care? Because we've been there. Yeah. We've, we've, We've been at rock bottom, well I've been at rock bottom before and I've run out of money. I've seen my kids go without and I won't have it for anybody else. One of the problems that comes with child poverty is the stress mm -hmm. that is put on the children because they feel like they mm -hmm. have to be the adult yeah. in the house. And that puts a great deal of pressure on them and it's almost robbing them of their childhood. It's really sad it to is. see. I had one family where they, they actually lived, it was probably about a 10 minute walk from the beach. Mm -hmm and we took them to the beach one day and we had a picnic and everything and the child actually said, this is the first time I've ever been to the beach. Mind the back here. Support workers Lisa and Nicola are working with around 30 families each. In many cases, the families could face social service involvement, something Lisa and Nicola are trying to prevent. They're taking me to meet a family they're especially worried about. They have two kids and are in a downward spiral of debt and unpaid bills. The situation with Kevin and Clay is um, they were first referred through mental health and debt issues. So how are they managing to, to get by? Obviously they're having problems with buying food, going shopping. And what sort of effect is that having on their children? It's having a massive effect on the children. It doesn't just affect them now, it affects them later on in life. Um, basically, they'll go into the same situation as what mum and dad did. See, pattern. Yeah. Mental health issues, depression. The family we've come to see live in Wall's End, where over half the children are living in families on benefits. Hi, you Hi, Kev. Hi, Hi. How are you doing? Are you alright? Hello, mate. Stephen. Hi, mate. Cheers for having us in. Kevin and Claire live in a council house with their two children, 10-year-old Leo and 11-year-old Lily May. I don't know if you just want to quickly check over some of the bits that I've put in here. I know that it states that it's weekly or monthly, I have put... Claire has like, suffered a breakdown and struggles to leave the house on her own. Oh. Kevin has recently lost his job and is looking for work. How do you feel the kids are getting on at school at the minute? As far as we know, they're getting on brilliant at school. Mm -hmm. Where did mum and dad sleep? Downstairs on the sofa. They sleep downstairs? Yeah. Isn't that really nice that they let you two have the bedrooms? Yeah. Every time we move house, like, they always get us to pick our bedrooms first. Yeah? Yeah. You must love your mum and dad. Yeah. Do you find it hard when you can't ask mum and dad for stuff? Sometimes. Sometimes. But we understand that the, the, like, the struggling. How aware are you about what they're upset about? I know some things, not all of it though. What are the things that you know? That my mum and dad are like struggling and my mum's had like a breakdown and that. The kids seem happy and loved, but I wonder what effect the stresses over money are having on them. So we can go through your uh, income and outgoings. We'll start with income, so benefits. 
it's Each week. £34 every Tuesday. Is that what you get, child benefit? Yeah. Per week, the family get around £219 in benefits, but after food and bills, they have no spare cash left. That's for the council tax. £475. Is that the main stress? Yeah, the debt and the money of where the next meal is going to come from, or the next loan money for the electric is going to come from when the meal has started to be Do so you used to see this worry as well? Can you feel it when your mum and dad are worried as well? Sometimes. If she hears electric meter beeping, she'll go around the house and start switching all the switches off. Oh, you're sure like you're like everything that's not being used. Yeah. Is... You're worrying yeah. about it as well, aren't you? She does, yeah. Mm -hmm. Probably you as well, and aren't you? Then yeah. she feels guilty when she's coming to us and saying, Mum, you know, it's such and such as birthday on Saturday. She invites us to a party, but I need a card and I need a present. And she starts getting a little upset because she knows that we're struggling. And I feel guilty. I feel like, like, we're letting the children down. It's not so much the council tax we as are worried about. It's more this one. Kevin's biggest concern is outstanding rent arrears on a previous property and a threat of a prison sentence. I do. I don't like to say like, <laughs> do you want to tell us? Just it's about four grand. That, that one's threat in jail for jail. 14 days. It's not that I refuse to pay, it's mm -hmm. just I can't. See you later. Thank you. See ya. Bye. See ya. Bye. With the debts out of control, the consequences for the family could be devastating. It's either bailiff action or threatening jail for Kevin. And if he goes to jail, how is that going to leave the family? Claire's not going to be able to manage. The kids aren't going to be able to manage without Dad. And to be honest, if it wasn't jail and it was bailiffs because they couldn't afford to pay, they're going to come into the family home and they're going to take what they have got and they haven't really got much. As you've seen, they've, they've got very little. And that'll probably affect the kids more than... Exactly. If Dad goes to prison and Lily May and Leo get taken away from Claire so they can't be with their mum or their dad, who suffers? They suffer. The kids suffer. And what happens later on in life? When they have kids, their kids probably suffer because they're so fucked up from the situation that they're put in. Having spent time with the kids, I couldn't stop thinking about how the difficulties they're facing now could affect them way beyond their childhood. Kids that grow up in poverty are more likely to be <laughs> adults living in poverty and their children are more likely to be children brought up in poverty and so on and so on and so on and it becomes an incredibly difficult, if not near impossible, cycle to break. You know, they end up finding it very difficult to find decent jobs, forging proper relationships and with that it becomes really difficult for them to make uh, you know, a proper contribution to society. But why would you make a contribution to a society which has given fuck all to you? So when you're out and about with your pals, who's the older lot? Who do you look up to? What kind of people? 14-year-old Tyler is still stuck in temporary accommodation in an old hotel in South London, and there's no sign of him and his family being rehoused. I want to find out more about what he wants from his future. What are your hopes and aspirations? Like, what do you want to do when you get out of school? Mechanics, scaffolding, painting, decorating, doing something with Proper your hands. Graft. Proper graft. Proper, yeah. I like that kind of thing. I'm not one of the ones that'll probably go to McDonald's and fold up bur fake burgers. I don't want to <laughs> do that. Fake burgers. <laughs> I want to do something that people are proud of me. Not saying every single person's lazy, but you've got them people that are on benefits, but they're not trying to get work. Mm -hmm. You've got other people that are, um, are on benefits and they're trying to get work. Yeah. So it's two different things. People that are on benefits and not trying to get work, you're just using the system, really. So I don't really want to be one of them people and get judged who I am. So I want to do work and help mum and help family, but... Yeah. Where do you want to end up when you're older? I would like to have a home in England and I'd like to have my home in Spain. The home in Spain will be like an inbuilt swimming pool. Nice balcony where you can see the beach. And the one at in England, I would rather just like a little calm down one. Probably still in a built-in swimming pool. Um, <laughs> Not much then. Have you travelled much? 
No, I've never been on board, but I'm looking to go abroad. Kids from poorer backgrounds are more likely to be excluded from school, be unemployed or end up in prison. Hello, yeah? Hello. You all right? Tyler wants to introduce me to his best friend, Buddy. Hello, mate. Buddy is one of more than two and a half million kids who, despite having a stable home and a parent in work, find themselves facing poverty. Mum Kelly works as a dinner lady, and mounting debts have left her suddenly struggling to provide for her children. They all want to go out and do things that, you know, that every other kid's doing. Mm -hmm. But if you ain't got the money, they can't go nowhere. Yeah. And then this is why they all get into trouble. But what does that lead to then? We've had three or four calls in a week. He's misbehaving, he's got another detention. I'm ending up having to go to court over it and everything now. I received this letter on Friday. Kelly's received a letter asking her to attend the court hearing because of Buddy's truancy. That's going to be more money that I've got to pay out. And it's more money that I haven't got. And if I end up going to prison over it or anything like that, because... You can go to you know, prison over it? Yeah, you can go to prison because of his attendance. When you hear your mum stressing about money and stuff, how does that make you feel? Sometimes I think, like, it's because of me. Like, not going to school and misbehaving and everything. But sometimes it's because where my dad hasn't been there and he's just left debt. And then that debt's just caught up with my mum, and mum hasn't had the money. Do you feel like there's a lot of misunderstanding? Do you feel like people don't really take into account or care about even what you've been through? Yeah. I don't really know the story to the family. Mm. So you're just a naughty kid? Yeah, that's what they think. You got tired of that? Yeah. Practically my brother. The government's line on poverty is the best route out is work. Kelly's working. She may be going to jail because she has a son who has problems with school attendance. He has behavioural issues. Because of things that are going on in the family, he misses his dad and... You know, whatever else, they're also not in the easiest situation. Things aren't easy, so he's letting his anger out. Fine, in the wrong places, by not showing up to school, by lashing out when he is at school, by being rude to people. He's a kid. If you take his mum away from him, the person who is working to make everything better, what does it do? Does it make things better or does it make them worse? Tyler and Buddy seem hyper aware of the financial pressures at home and they're self-conscious about how money affects their other friendships. You ever feel like you're missing out on stuff? Yeah, sometimes. Sometimes. Because I don't have as much opportunities as other children. They can go cinemas, they can do whatever they want. Well, that must upset you. It does, yeah. Do you find that people make assumptions? Yeah, like, most people judge. Like, oh, he hasn't got nice shoes. He's poor, or he ain't got like nice style or anything, so he can't hang around with us and stuff like that. Can't chill with us because you're poor. You're wearing Primark slippers, you're wearing Primark pumps. I'm wearing Air Maxes. Blah blah blah. What does your friendship mean to each other? I always be there for Buddy, really, isn't it? Like I know if Tyler, like say he got kicked out of that place there and then he had nowhere to go. I know for a fact that my mum will bring him in and treat him like one of us, but I know that it'll be a bit hard, like, in the situation that we're in now, like, to pay for everything. So my mum might maybe ask his mum for, like, £10 a week or something just for, like, the electric or the gas or something like that. Back in North Tyneside, the family I'd met have had their benefits stopped. It's an administrative error, but while they wait for it to be sorted, they don't have a penny to buy food. Hello. Hello. What's happening? You're right. I'm joining the workers from the Tyne Gateway project to deliver an emergency food package. 
Clear as a slate work. Kev, I'm just going to have a look and put it in. Just like a big one. Perfect example, yes. Okay, where to keep your bread? Just on the bench. On the bench. Do you want you me to unpack these, yeah? Giant peas. Corn beef. Yeah. Obviously, today has been a bit of a tough day, but we've getting there, we've getting all your, your money sorted, we've getting some bits and pieces for you. Hopefully, see you through the next few days. But, like, don't be frightened to ask for another food parcel if you need it. Vegetables. If families use the services of a food bank too frequently, it can sometimes put them on the radar of social services. The first food bank that was for me the most uh, degrading time yeah. ever. I was standing at the door and for some fella to go, there you go, so there's some tins of soup or whatever. Do you know what I mean? I suppose it's never a position you saw yourself in. Mm. You said about the gas in that before. Is that something you have to be really conscious with now, the gas and electricity? Not really. It's stupid because people don't realise that the ones that are with the meters are the ones that are struggling to budget and struggling to make ends meet. And the ones with the bills are getting the cheaper end of the deal. Yeah. Yeah, it's more expensive to have a meter in. So you're getting penalised? Because, because you, you have less. a bill, yeah. It seems a bit backwards, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Basically, it's on 7 87 at the minute, mm -hmm. but we're already owe six pounds from debt. So the next time you put a tenner on, it will take what you've used in the emergency and then the six pound. Oh, uh, so yeah, you're constantly feeding the meters all the time. And when it comes to, say, the bulbs for the, the lighting of the house, I don't go out and buy bulbs. The bulbs I've got in the house, I just move between each light fitting. So, like... So then you only light the room where you are at the time? Where we are at the time, aye, and... It's probably beyond comprehension for most people. Th th this is it, it's just a light bulb. Mm -hmm. But there's probably loads of other families out there that probably do exactly the same as me. What are the biggest fears at the moment? Losing the house. Losing the kids. Is that a real prospect? Losing the houses. And obviously if we lose the house. Then losing the kids, that's pretty common. That, that's that's why we're do that's why we're doing all this because we want to be out of this hole out when we want to see the light at the end of the tunnel. You know what I mean? We don't want future generations having to deal with this. Mm -hmm. You know, to see a man come that close to tears, it just brought back a lot of, you know, being the man in the house struggling, not feeling able to provide and what thoughts that led him to have. And selfishly, you know, it brought me back to, you know, what my dad ended up doing. You just think, he's not the only person. There's so many people that are in that position. In London, a housing shortage means more than 53,000 of the poorest households are living in temporary or emergency accommodation. Since being evicted from their home six weeks ago, 10-year-old Kelly Louise has been living in a temporary one-bedroom apartment with mum Nikki and her two younger siblings. So this is home? Yeah, this is home. Mm -hmm. We're lucky we've got one of the big rooms. Yeah. And we've got our own bathroom. This is my bed. Yeah. Yeah, I like shotguns. Um, this is Kirsty's bed. The family are struggling to adjust to the new accommodation. There's no outside space for the kids to play. The noise from the other residents is keeping them up at night, and they have to share a kitchen with around 10 other families. What about cooking and stuff? Normally, we have microwave meals, because the kitchen um, is really stinky in there. The cooker isn't clean. 
I cooked in there once yeah. and we tasted all the other food, so none of them wanted to eat it. So yeah, I've never cooked in there again. And this is um, our fridge freezer. We're lucky that we actually got one. I was going to say, yeah, otherwise you wouldn't be able to keep any food. And our radio doesn't work, so we've got this little heater. It's getting cold now as well, isn't it? Yeah, the heating weren't working. And I was like, please give me something. So they gave me a storage heater. And it ain't changed since <laughs> six yeah. weeks later. So, But at least it keeps us warm. Yeah, and this is our bathroom. The sink was coming off, so they took it off and they've still got to place it. So you haven't got a sink? No. But we've got a bath, though. Yeah. Yeah. What are you drawing now? Um, I'm drawing a girl that's up and the girl that's down. Mm -hmm. And this one's not happy. And she's got short hair because of all the stress. Um, this one's um, the girl that I want to be and um, this one's the one that um, I'm feeling right now. Your mum is worried that you might be bottling a lot of stuff up. Yeah, I, um, I try to keep it in because I don't really like people seeing how I feel because and then it's putting them in lots of trouble just to get me set um, fine. So, um, really, what I do is that um, during the night, um, I just um, squeeze onto something. Sometimes during the day, um, I just squeeze onto whatever's near me and um, it really helps me um, better than just keeping it normally. Helps me get my grip. And sometimes you can see me pinching myself just to get myself a grip. And I know it's a really bad habit, but. I don't know what else to do. Yeah. I'm shocked at the impact their living arrangements seem to be having on Kelly. I worry about the effect it's having on her mental health. It's really upsetting to hear Kelly Louise talk about pinching herself because if you think about the reason that she said she was doing it, and this is a 10-year-old girl, telling me that she pinches herself when she can't handle how she feels emotionally. And we know for a fact that kids who grow up in poverty are much more likely to suffer problems with their mental health. And if that doesn't ring alarm bells, then I don't know what does. You know, to me, that sounds, and I might be extreme for saying this, but it doesn't sound that far off of self-harm. You know, I can't tolerate how I feel up here, so I'm going to cause myself pain here to stop me thinking about it or to stop me crying or to stop me showing people how I feel. I think that's really, really, really disturbing. Kelly's mum told me she was seeking help from a counsellor at Kelly's school. In the time I've spent with the families, not much seems to have improved for them. In my adult life, I've now seen several governments fail to meet their own targets on reducing child poverty. And the number of poor kids in Britain has been rising, not falling, in recent years. Since I last saw Tyler eight weeks ago, his situation has reached a point of crisis. The family have no money to buy food and they've had to resort to their last option. So it's Tara? Yes, yeah? it is. And you're? Tyler. You're Tyler. Yeah. Okay, do you want to take a seat for me, guys? I will guys? do, you thank you. There? They've come to the local Salvation Army food bank for a food parcel. I don't really like being seen in food banks because like, knowing that you can't afford food or something and you have to come to a food bank to get it, it's quite like embarrassing kind of. I know you say you find it embarrassing to come here, but do you appreciate the fact that there is somewhere like this to come to? Yeah, like, obviously, if it wasn't for, like, people like Salvation Army and all that, um, it, like, we probably wouldn't have had dinner tonight or something. A record figure of more than a million food parcels were handed out last year. Nearly half were given to families with children. I remember one individual, perhaps eight or nine-year-old girl, and they came to us quite late one night. And I went out and because they said, we've, we've literally got nothing. And we went out with a food package, a food parcel. 
and this girl was actually sleeping on the floor, wrapped in a, you know, the, the lagging from around a, a hot water boiler. And that was all that they could give her that night. Just hits home, innit? it? Like, why should people have to come here for food? It's, it's mental that we live in a society that, you know, it's, it's not the image that people promote when they show off the great things about Great Britain, is it? And I mean, is this Great Britain? What's great about this? The food parcel should last the family three or four days, but it might not be long before they have to return. There's also been some worrying news. Tyler attends a pupil referral unit for kids who have been excluded from mainstream school, but reports of his behaviour are putting his place there at risk. Very matter of fact, isn't it? Yeah. Tyler has lost all his respect points today. Kicking and banging on doors is not acceptable. I really like Tyler. He's a smart and articulate young man, so I was shocked to learn that he's been kicked out of four schools in the last four years. He's been known to throw tables across the room, swear at teachers. There's a lot of stop swearing. Moody today needs to stop swearing. A mixed day for Tyler. Please learn to control your swearing. Um, it's now after 9.30 a.m. and Tyler has not arrived at school. Disrespectful towards staff and students, throwing stones into the car park next door and not leaving sight when asked. Not a good day. As soon as I walk through the doors of the Peru, I'm like, I don't really want to be here because it's a Peru. I would rather be in a mainstream school, but mm. I know I'll be probably getting a job when I'm older. The bad days are making it harder for you to go back into a mainstream school, aren't it? Mm, yeah. Because all of this, everything, you know, and it, you can see what it stems from, is it's, it's the living environment. Yeah. But all of that is going to have a knock-on effect to, to his options later on in life. Exactly, and I worry about that so much. I really worry. I've been told so many times, he's really smart, he's really brainy, but he can't be bothered. So I worry that in the future, he's not going to have many prospects. Like, there's been plenty of times when I've been like, oh, mum, why are you so poor or something? But like, then when I think back of it, I'm like, sorry, mum, like, I didn't mean, really mean to call you poor. Like, mum's just trying to do her best, isn't it? She's done a lot for us. She's just trying to do her best, really, isn't it? Right, yeah. Tara told me he's at risk of being moved to another school. And with his education and self-esteem already suffering, I was deeply concerned about what impact this would have on his future. Back in Dagnum, after eight weeks in dilapidated emergency accommodation, Kelly Louise's family have become one of the lucky ones. They've been assigned a new home by the council. Hello, how are you doing? You all right? Yeah. This is oh, different. No. <laughs> oh, I'm so happy for you. Oh, it's amazing. It's brilliant. So, just the change in the kids as well, you know what I mean? Seeing their faces are happy and... Yeah and it's like a weight's lifted. This is a bathroom. With a sink? Yeah. And it's a bit big. And we've got shower head as well now. <laughs> you want to see the kitchen? Yeah, come on in. Is this where all the magic happens? Yeah. Is this where Chef Kelly cooks all the... Chef Mummy, really. Ah, <laughs> right. This is our room. And this is Kirsty's and mine bunk bed. Which yeah. one's yours? Um, top bunk. Yeah. Yeah. I would need to be on the bottom bunk, but Kirsty's only six. Fair enough. Yeah. Kelly Louise's mum, Nikki, has relied on charities and free websites to furnish their home, but they're still short of basic furniture and beds. What's next on the list for the house? Um, for the house is curtains, obviously my mum's my mum bed. And I'm also hoping that on my next birthday I can have friends round. And have a birthday party. Yeah. Girl time. Girl, girl time. <laughs> girl time. It's me and my friends. It's just you and your mates. And have the privacy to do it. 
The two bedroom rental property is close to Kelly's school, but it's still temporary. And they've been told by the council they'll have to move again soon. Four walls, a roof, so no water can get in. I think we're finished. Done. What sort of difficulties are you facing here? The food and gas and electric is fine. I'll budget for them first, because they're priorities. Um, but then it's, it's the little things like clothes, shoes, toys. It's hard. If they need a coat, for instance, it's like 20, 25 pounds for a coat. But then if all three of them need a coat, that's like 70 60, 75 pounds. With everything that Kelly's opened up about, do you worry about her mental health? Yeah, especially after hearing what she's been saying. I do, I do worry about her because I don't want her to feel that way and go through that. She seems so emotionally mature in one way. Yeah. That it's frightening she's able to say, you know, consciously, I don't share those feelings because I don't, I don't want to share those feelings. Yeah. That's upsetting in itself, because you think, you know, let it out, you'll feel better. Tyler still has no idea when they might be moved from their cramped emergency accommodation. And with Christmas approaching, things seem to be taking their toll. Especially your mum, Tara. What's Christmas Day going to consist of? What you see is what it's going to be. No Christmas dinner. No Christmas presents. The boys are going to be sitting here with me. We're going to be watching TV, eating like we always eat. Noodles, scrambled egg. But it is what it is. There's no getting away from it. I can't tell them, oh, this is going to be our last Christmas, because who knows? You know, I thought last year was going to be our one and only Christmas, being homeless. But we're here again. A lot of people say, well, at least, you know, next Christmas, you'll have your own place and it'll be a lot better. But who's to say we're not going to be here next Christmas? There's just no light at the end of the tunnel. Tyler is one of 130,000 kids having to spend Christmas in temporary accommodation. What was Christmas like before you were living in the in the b, &B? I loved it. I loved waking up on the 24th, waking up on the, like, going to sleep on the 24th, waking up on the 25th, it's Christmas. Everyone used to run downstairs, open our presents, see what we've got, all get excited. I loved it. But yeah, look, oh, yeah, that's, all presents on the floor? that's all presents that we used to get. You couldn't see the tree, it was full of presents. That's when my mum was fit and able to work. And that was Christmas morning, so literally you can still see it's dark outside. Yeah. We used to wake up at 6.30, look. <laughs> 6.30, and that was back in 2008. Your mum put a lot of decorations on the tree. Yeah, she put a lot of, we had you one. We had a lot in the house, it all around the curtains. That's outside. Is that the old house, yeah? Yeah, that's the old house. I wish I could still be there. It'll never be the same. Yeah, it'll never be the same like it used to be. This is the second Christmas they're spending in that space. You know, hopefully they do move into permanent accommodation and they do get back into a house and they get out of where they're living now, but, you know, these years are always going to stick with Tyler. They're always going to have had an effect. Today in the Houses of Parliament, there's an all-party meeting to discuss child poverty and a campaign is being launched to raise awareness of the issue. I asked the organisers if I could bring Kelly Louise and her mum. They invited Kelly Louise to say a few words in front of a room full of MPs and journalists. Now, I always think that personal testimony is the best way to influence change. So I hope you can give Kelly Louise a really warm welcome so that she can tell us about her experiences. Thank you very much. Um, thank 
you. Um, I just really want to um, um, say some words. Money is always a worry for all families. Um, and I miss out on a lot of things as well as other families um, because my parents sometimes don't have enough money. We had to move out of our home because our landlord was selling our house. And we had to wait until the council found us a place to live. That day I was really nervous and I saw my mum upset and worried. Um, it made me feel upset and helpless. When we found out where we were moving to, which was a hostel, the stress didn't go away. We had to stay in a place where everyone was unhappy. My family was forced to stay in one room. I got really upset that I cried a lot. Why does my mum and other mums worry about having a roof over our heads? How would you feel if what happened to me and other kids happened to you? Do you know how your decisions affect other children like me? I think Kelly Louise was incredible. People actually took notice. What more could you ask for from a 10-year-old girl that was able to stand up in a room full of MPs and tell them exactly how she feels about the situation that she and many others are in? You're right. Yeah. She was fantastic. The really sad thing is, despite people being probably quite shocked about what she said and being moved and being upset by it all, when everyone leaves that room and the door closes, what changes? Probably very little. We live in one of the world's richest countries and we have four million children growing up in poverty. That figure is set to raise by a million in the next five years. They're children who are having to deal with the pain and the stress and the suffering that adults have to deal with, but without the tools to handle it. Everything they're going through now is going to stick with them for the rest of their lives. It makes me feel ashamed. <laughs>